after you've gone, we'll sing a glad song. After you've gone, it will not take long. So the Grassroots Organization of Wanakee Grow organized a speaker event today with all the people that are running for U.S. Wisconsin State Senate. Um, so, yes, I'm Dr. Jillian Bettino. People just call me Jill. I also answer to mom, doc, Jillian, all sorts of things. Um, I am incredibly proud to be stepping into this race with a really remarkable group of principled, powerful Democrats. We are going to get rid of Ron Johnson. As I'm going out and talking with folks uh, across the state, I'm asking them, so, you know, what is your primary concern? That's the number one. That's what everyone says to begin with. And I'm not just talking about Democrats. I'm talking about Republicans as well. People are disappointed with his performance. He's not the same guy that ran 10 years ago. And we need to make sure that we're reaching out to those folks who maybe would like to find something better. We want to raise the bar. We're not just better than Ron Johnson. We're better than any Republican candidate. So I'll tell you a quick few things about myself so you can kind of get an idea of where I'm from um, and what drives me. I'm very passionate about health inequity and specifically very passionate as a physician about every human being's right for health care. I truly believe that every single person in this country should have health care. They should have comprehensive health care. I call that Medicare for all, but it's more than that. It's health care that includes preventive care, surgical and emergency care, end-of-life care, hearing, vision, dental care, addiction care, psychiatric care. This is something that we can do. I am not comfortable with the concept of walking into a classroom of 20 perfect kindergartners and picking out the one or two that I'm not going to provide health care for. Right now in this country, we have approximately 5 to 9% of our children do not have health insurance. And this is particularly difficult for me to swallow. My dad died at age 29 from rheumatic heart disease because he did not have treatment for strep throat. Strep throat. I mean, is there anybody here that hasn't had strep throat? This is the kind of thing that we are still risking by not providing health care for everyone. So think about that. Health care for everyone. This is important. We can do this. We can do this and we can save six trillion dollars over a decade according to my economics team so let's do that let's make that happen another thing that i'm very excited and passionate about is climate change solutions i found this app where you can go in and put your hometown on there and see what the temperature was when you were a kid compared with the temperatures now my hometown i was born in athens ohio is much hotter. I bet yours is too. It is long past time. My goodness, I cannot believe that we have waited so long. We are at a crossroads. If we don't turn things around, we're not going to have the opportunity to do it. And not only that, but this opportunity to confront climate change head on, get our head out of the sand. I, I don't know where Ron Johnson's head is, but it's definitely not with climate change solutions. We definitely have the opportunity here not only to confront climate change solutions, but to bolster our economy with those solutions, to strengthen our unions, to center racial justice, wealth inequity, education injustice. All of these things can be part of that solution. Imagine the world that we could build if we put as much effort into this as we have so many other successful endeavors going to the moon creating the, the computer industrialization of this, of this world. These things are just a, a hint at what we can accomplish together. Our planet will be beautiful for our children and our grandchildren, and it's time to make that happen. And my final third thing that I'm really excited and passionate about, and we've been talking about since I was like a teenager, which was a long time ago, uh, is, is um, immigration reform. Right now on our border, we have unacceptable circumstances. And it's unacceptable because it's inhumane. It's unacceptable because it's unnecessary. 
and it's unacceptable because it is dangerous. There are things happening at our border because of a lack of funding, a lack of technology. Drugs are coming into the country, unwanted, unneeded criminals are coming into the country, and most importantly, people who need our help are not able to get it. People are traveling across from Central and South America, where I have spent a lot of my career working, and they're escaping terrible realities, and they get here and they can't get in, or they have to be separated from their children, or they die in a, in a boat accident just off of our coast. These are the kind of things that we can create solutions for. It's long past time. I hope you will join me. I am so excited to be here. We will be back. We are a grassroots movement, which means I'm talking to everybody. I want you to have a moment to look at our website. It's patino.us. All kinds of policy on there. And please reach out to us. We are available, we respond, we engage, and we are energized to get rid of Ron Johnson. Thank you. I will tell you, if somebody would have said over a year ago that I would be running for this U.S. Senate seat, I would say, no, that's crazy. You know, I was never one of those kids that was drawing, you know, American flags or memorizing the Wisconsin Constitution. But as it was mentioned, as a fifth generation Wisconsinite and as the daughter of two public school teachers, something that my parents taught me very early on in life is that when you see something wrong, you've got to stand up and do something about it. And honestly, that's how I've lived my entire life, whether it was my time at the Pentagon, and you can only imagine a 20-something-year-old walking into the five-sided castle. They gave me a few months. I was there for almost eight years doing work, whether it was language and culture strategy to addressing morale for the Under Secretary of Defense and loved it to my work in microfinance, where we were providing access to capital for women, communities of color, financing green energy products or affordable health care. And it was honestly that work that led me to the state treasurer's office because I found out that the amount of capital that Silicon Valley gets in one day is what Wisconsin gets in an entire year. And I thought that was wrong. We should be taking care of Main Street, not Wall Street. And that's why I reached out to the state treasurer. I know many of you know that story. They never returned my call. Why? Because remember that guy, Scott Walker? Boo! He tried to get rid of the state treasurer's office because who needs checks and balances in government? I mean, absolutely crazy. And I am proud to say that I led the Save Our Fiscal Watchdog ballot committee and we stopped together Scott Walker's power grab with 63% of the vote. Um, which is a landslide victory, as many of you know, in the state of Wisconsin. And then I decided to step up and run for that office. And thanks to many of you, I took more of the vote share than the governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general, and won in Trump counties, because that stuff matters. So what has it been like being state treasurer? It has been wild, because look, our legislature, thanks to Robin Voss, decided not to work for 300 days in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of an economic crisis, and in the middle of a social justice crisis, they were taking a taxpayer vacation in the time that we needed the most. And so as state treasurer with no additional resources from the federal government or from the state, I had to be Wisconsin scrappy to help millions of Wisconsinites who were struggling. We provided a special distribution for our public schools so they could buy hotspots because people were telling me that they were driving their kids to McDonald's because they couldn't access and learn online. To starting a foreclosure prevention fund to keep people in their homes. To literally financing over 180 projects across the state when revenues were down and expenditures were up. And we know that essential services are critical to our front lines and keeping us safe. So I'm doing all of this and I'm calling Ron Johnson's office He's like, not my problem, Sarah. It's not bad. I mean, this is insane. We're literally watching this guy take a private plane from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to Washington, D.C., saying Wisconsinites don't need help. He single-handedly upheld $1,400 checks, money for small businesses, and expanding our vaccination program. And if that wasn't enough, we all saw what happened on January 6th. I've got news for Ron Johnson. It was not a peaceful protest. It was a violent insurrection. And so as somebody who has spent their career in national security, 
who is a fifth generation Wisconsinite, I just could not sit on the sidelines anymore and I had to get in this race. And I will tell you, I couldn't be more different than Ron Johnson. You know, as a proud product of Wisconsin public schools, I believe in science. I mean, what a concept. I mean, we right now have a US Senator who says Greenland was green. You know, one of the first actions that I did when I was elected is I overturned a Republican gag order where we couldn't even talk about climate change and then continued to build on renewable investments that actually um, in clean water because it's good for our people and it's good for our economy. You know, as a working mom, I will tell you, paid family leave and affordable childcare are absolutely critical. We know more women are out of the workforce now and the last time we saw these numbers were in the 1980s. And when I talk to people, they say, well, Sarah, those are nice to have policies. And I'm like, for who? They're critical for the economic security of so many families. And I believe one of the reasons these policies are not front and center is because we need more working moms at the US Senate table. You know, I will also say as the state's chief financial officer, trickle down economics does not work. I will say it again, it does not work. I mean, it is crazy that I think about my parents who are public school teachers, they pay a higher percentage in taxes than Jeff Bezos. I mean, what is wrong with this country? Or we know that, you know, Ron Johnson has done everything he can to give corporate tax breaks to fossil fuel industries and to corporations rather than hardworking Wisconsinites. And you know, enough is enough. And the other thing that I will just say, and I don't know about anybody else here, is that I am sick of him legislating by conspiracy theory. We need someone who's gonna actually legislate and focus on kitchen table issues that matter most to us. For example, voting rights. I mean, democracy is under attack every single day and we are seeing it right here in the legislature. We've gotta get the John Act and we've gotta get the For the People Act done or a justice system that works for everybody, or investing in rural Wisconsin, or making sure that we have actually affordable prescription drugs, and the list goes on. But here's what I will say. You know, people will say running for the US Senate is hard, and I don't know if we can beat Ron Johnson. Well, I will tell you, I've been doing hard things my entire life, whether it is working at the Pentagon, saving the state treasurer's office, to, to up, stepping up during the pandemic. And I'm gonna do this for Wisconsinites because together, as a full Packer fan that was said, I know politics are a team sport. And the only way we can flip this seat is through a grassroots movement where we are all working together. And I believe that together we can do this and flip this seat. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks for spending your Sunday to listen more about this race. And let's do this, Wisconsin. I'm Alex Lazary. I was the senior vice president for the Milwaukee Bucks before I jumped in this race. And I got in because I think we need a change in Washington. Um, whether it's his constant conspiracy theorizing, his felty to Donald Trump, or his just general indifference to the job. You know, Ron Johnson has shown us time and time again that he is not fit to be our US Senator. And that's been a really big problem for us because that means for the last 10 years, we've only had one US Senator fighting on our behalf and fighting for our interests in Washington. And that's why I'm running because we need to give Tammy Baldwin a true partner in DC to bring some real change and real results for the people of Wisconsin. And what I think we need in that candidate is something a little bit different. Uh, I'm not a politician, but I have worked in the highest levels of politics. Uh, I worked for President Obama and Valerie Jarrett in the White House during his first term. Uh, and I led the bid to bring the DNC convention here to Wisconsin. So I know how politics work, but we've also got a real record of accomplishment on a lot of the issues that we're all fighting for. You know, when people talk about things like a $15 minimum wage, well, we actually pay that. We pay that in Pfizer form. And when people talk about, you know, creating good jobs, well, we've done it. We've created thousands of good union jobs that all pay a living wage. And when it comes to things like racial and social justice, well, we've been on the front lines. You know, we've been marching in the streets. We were the first ownership group to march with our players uh, in response to the, to the killings of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and the shooting of Jacob Blake. We boycotted a basketball game to ensure that we brought national attention uh, to an issue that has been plaguing our country. 
And we also made sure that we worked to get some real results done. Uh, we've worked with the Milwaukee Police Department um, and the Racine Correctional Facility to ensure that we were creating some real reform and highlighting issues such as recidivism and drug incarceration. And then when it came to voting rights, I led our Bucks vote effort to ensure that we not only became the first arena in the country to offer ourselves as a voting center, but we also partnered with organizations like Michelle Obama and LeBron James's to ensure that we were using our entire Deer District to register people to vote. And I think this was a big reason why we were able to turn Wisconsin blue in 2020. And so what we hope to show, what we hope to show in this campaign is that progressive values are good for business, are good for the economy, but most importantly are good for the country. Uh, and these were values that I've grown up with. Uh, my dad wasn't born in this country. Uh, he was actually born in the Jewish quarter of Marrakesh, Morocco. And his parents brought him here because they wanted to give him a better life and better opportunity. So they brought him here when he was about seven or eight years old. Uh, he didn't speak the language and they had no money, but he was able to get a good public school education. He was able to work his way through college and graduate without a crushing amount of debt. And he was able to find a good union job. Uh, he was a teamster driving UPS trucks out of college. Uh, he had, you know, he has a good Jewish mom, so she said, you can do that, but you've got to go to law school or medical school. And so he ended up going to law school and went down a different path. But, but that story is really hard to write today. That opportunity is not available to everyone, and that's why I'm in this race. Because I want to make sure that no matter your zip code, you can get a good public school education. That you can go to college or community college or trade school and graduate without a crushing amount of debt. And most importantly, that you can find that good union job, one that pays you a living wage so you don't have to work a second or third job just to support your family. And that message is something that is resonating from across the state of Wisconsin. Um, we've been able to get some of the most important endorsements from people around the state, and whether that's Milwaukee County Executive David Crowley or Kenosha County Exec Jim Cruiser, uh, Sheila Stubbs, the state rep from Madison. Uh, we've been able to get Dave Hansen, the former state senator from Green Bay, Dana Walks from Eau Claire, uh, Mary Arnold in Columbus, and a number of other current and former state legislators and activists who have all joined our campaign. And we've also been able to get a number of union endorsements. Uh, we've gotten the Teamsters, uh, IBW 494, and our local IATSE who have all joined this campaign because we practice what we preach. We are the only campaign in the country to have, to have a unionized campaign staff. And that's something that's important to us because when you want to see someone's values, if you want to see what they're going to actually do as your next U.S. Senator, see how they run their organization and see how they run their campaign. That's how you're going to know that these are values that we're not just talking about, but we're leading on and we're acting upon. And so we're making sure to take that message all across Wisconsin. Um, we're going to make sure that we're running a campaign that says why us and not why not someone else. And what we also really want to make sure that we're doing is telling everybody that we're going to represent not just the 50 some odd percent of people that vote for us, but 100 percent of the state. And so we're going to follow the Tony Evers, Tammy Baldwin model of going to places that Democrats have at time neglected and Republicans, quite frankly, have taken for granted. And so I couldn't be more excited to be on this journey with you. I hope to be able to work with you all as we not only work to defeat Ron Johnson, but also make sure that we reelect uh, Attorney General Josh Call and to make sure that we reelect Tony Evers as well, because we need to show that progressive values are ways that and is are the ways that's going to make this state grow and is going to make this state um, move forward and to keep uh, our progress. So I just want to say thank you all. Uh, it's great to be out here and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you all again soon. So thank you. We're going into one of the best election years of our lifetime. Let's hear it, Democrats. All right. That's what I like to hear. All right. So the second best thing to all these good Democrats here gathering in this wonderful, beautiful day, the second best thing, this is a county park. And as a county executive, there's nothing more than I appreciate a place like this for a community to gather. Now, one of the top issues that you are going to hear, or at least what I've heard people ask, is who can beat Ron Johnson? I am the only candidate running, as Mark had mentioned, 
who has won election and re-election six times in a tough part of the state. Three times as a legislator and three times as a county executive, which I am right now. And in addition to that, I know this is kind of passe though, but I think I've got some good background and good experience to be a good U.S. Senator, having been a legislator, being down in Madison as a majority leader. And when I say majority leader, people look at me and say, are, are you a Republican? Because when was the last time we were in the majority in the legislature here? But there was a time we had great legislators like Spencer Black, like Joe Parisi, like Mark Pulcan, on and on. And we did some good things. We were able to push the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which was a precursor to the Green New Deal, which I support right now. We were able to get legislation passed that allowed the children of undocumented immigrants to be able to get an education at a UW school at in-state tuition, which is also a very similar piece of legislation that's going, that, 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 that we adopted that, that unfortunately is being challenged, and that, is, and that is DACA. So these are the types of things that we can be proud of here in Wisconsin. This happened recently, but the proud progressive tradition, that is our roots. It's who we are, it's what we believe in. And people ask all the time, what happened to Wisconsin? I talk to folks all over this country, and they want to know what happened here. And I believe that as difficult and as dark as the last 10 years have been, I believe, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that this will be, in the long course of history in this state, it will be a blip. And the reason why is we have gatherings like this. We have committed hardworking Democrats all over the state, whether it is in Dane County, or if it's in Kenosha County, or if it's in Southwest Wisconsin, or if it's in Superior, wherever it is, we are committed and we are dedicated to doing that. So my story is a story that I think a lot of folks here in Wisconsin have heard before. I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood in a village called Little Chute in Outagamie County, population 7,097. And I grew up on Carolyn Drive where all of the dads worked at the paper mill, except for one, my dad who wore the white collar, who was a Lutheran pastor. And so I learned two very important lessons when I was growing up. Number one, the importance of serving your community. And number two, the importance of working families and how they built not just Carolyn Drive and Little Shoot and Outagamie County, but this state and this country. I learned about the issues that they are concerned about. I, le I, I learned about the challenges, the things that are important to them. And my dad said, if you are in a position, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do with your life, never forget where you came from. And I never have. And whether as a legislator or as a county executive, if there was a piece of legislation that came across my desk, I would ask a simple question. Is this good for the families on Carolyn Drive? When there was a line item in my budget as county executive, I asked the question, is this good for the working families on Carolyn Drive, the folks in western Wisconsin, the family farmers like my aunt and uncle, the, the supper club owners on Grand Avenue in Little Chute. That is what I'm going to do in Washington. I'm not a millionaire or a billionaire. This race is about the working families of the state. This is about defeating someone like Ron Johnson, who is an unmitigated disaster and is up to him. It's up to us to defeat him because people in the state are looking for a leader to do that, but also people across the country are looking for a leader to do that well. This race is not just about the state. It is about this country, and it is about the future. The U.S. Senate, who controls the U.S. Senate, comes right through Wisconsin, just as it did for the White House two years before that, the White House four years before that, on and on. This is a tremendous responsibility an awesome responsibility, but as I go across the state, this is a 72 county campaign, and I talk to people, and I look folks in the eyes. I look at Democrats, I look at progressives that are gonna work morning, noon, and night to make sure that we get rid of Ron Johnson and we progress, put a true blue progressive 
back into the White House. Let me just conclude by saying this. The power of community, what I said in my speech about what my dad taught me and what we did on Carolyn Drive. I got a great story. It's a story of Appleton Cody, which is a paper mill in Combined Locks, Wisconsin. And four years ago, that mill went into receivership, and everybody had written it off. They wrote the obituary of Appleton Coded, except the local union and myself and a few others decided to fight back. We objected to that sale to a scrap dealer. We went before a judge. We convinced him to give us a second chance to start that mill. We made that scrap dealer run that mill, and we found out within a couple of months, sure enough, we could make paper, we could make a profit, and we could bring folks back to work. 300 paper workers came back and are working today. That mill was so successful that when he sold it, when the scrap dealer sold it two years after he bought it, he cleared almost $100 million. Think about that. He wouldn't have been able to see a fraction of this if he did not listen to the community, if he did not listen to that labor union and the elected leaders. I also believe that when that happens, that is emblematic of why we have income inequality, why workers, why quick like communities like, like, like Little Shoe or Wanaki, we just don't get a fair shake. We need someone in Washington who's not a millionaire, who's not a billionaire, who knows the issues and the challenges that face this state and face the country, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Thank you. So I have five minutes to tell you a story that you'll remember for 13 months. It's tough to tell that story. I'm not just an IT guy, I own a software company I have for 20 years. I've been incredibly fortunate. I've traveled the world scuba diving, playing poker with my wife. She does both. And in 2016, in November, the day after, I got a call from my wife. She was traveling, she was international, and she had heard the news, and she was crying. My sister texted me that same day and said, how do I explain this to my daughter? In 2018, the blue wave hit, and it didn't impact Wisconsin. The GOP had gerrymandered things to such an extent that despite all of our efforts, they still won in dramatic fashion 46% of the vote, 64% of the seats. It offended me, as I suspect it did most of you, probably all of you really. At that moment, I realized that I had the resources, I had the opportunity, and I absolutely had the motivation to step into politics. Because my state assembly and my state senators had run unopposed yet again. So last year, I hopped into the race for state senate. We were about a 30 point underdog as most, so many of the state senate races were. And we lost by 19, not too bad. But here was the cool part. We increased Democratic voting in that district, which is down Franklin, Muskego, New Berlin, relatively red. We increased voting in that district for Democrats by 28%. Now, if you've listened to Ben Wickler from uh, the, the Wisconsin State Democrats Party, he'll tell you that across Wisconsin, we are up 18%, and that was for Joe Biden. He did 18% better than Hillary Clinton had done in 2016, and he had almost exactly the same vote total that they had in uh, 2012 with Barack Obama. So 18%. Down ballot, the races that I was in, the races that matter to you, almost every Democratic state Senate race dropped last year. 
We're up 18% at the presidential level, and every level dropped except for two. I'll take credit for the big one, at least a little credit. So I think as we go forward, as we look at what's going to be happening in the next election, we've alluded to the fact that we've had 1% wins or less for Governor Evers, 1% or less for President Biden, a 1% or less loss for Hillary or Adam Clinton. If you go back before that 1%, there's this thought that Wisconsin is purple. I don't agree. Here's why. I think, I believe, rather, that if we are willing to talk to people, we have the opportunity to grow it. So let me ask you guys a quick question. I'm an instructor. Like I said, I own a software company and we teach. So part of being an instructor is I get to ask questions. So hopefully you'll respond. How many of you, show of hands or clap, whatever you want to do, have lost friends or family due to politics? There we go. All right? I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. And what a tragedy is that? All right? The very first person that I had in my office when we started the campaign and we had COVID and masks and distancing and stuff, the very first person that I had in my office was a raging libertarian. God help me, if any of you have dealt with those guys. No offense to the raging libertarians who might be here. But we sat for three hours and we talked. And at the end of it, he said, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I can't vote for you because you have a D in front of your name, but I agree with a lot of what you're saying. There's a gentleman by the name of Daryl Davis. When you get home, look him up in his TED talk. Daryl Davis, about 30 years ago, chose to set up an interview with a KKK Grand Dragon. What he didn't tell him is that he was black. So, right. <laughs> so you can imagine his surprise when this Grand Dragon and his guard showed up and there's this black gentleman to interview him. And to his credit, and I don't give much credit, but to his credit, he and his guards sat down and they had a conversation with this black man who they point blank told, we are better than you. Races should be split, point blank. And Daryl Davis listened. And then they met again. And then they met again. And then they started to do lunch and they had dinner and they became friends. And over the course of 20 years, the Grand Dragon became the Imperial Wizard. And I wish I were making these names up. And he also became the goddaughter, or excuse me, godfather of Daryl Davis as a black man's daughter. And then one day, he gave it all up. And he gave Daryl Davis his robes. And Daryl travels the country telling that story. I don't think talking to libertarians and Republicans and conservatives is nearly as difficult as what that black man did sitting down with the Grand Dragon of the KKK. So that's my format. That's why we increased voting 28%. Because I interacted online with trolls for Pete's sake. And I had consultants ask me why I would do that. Tell me that it was not worth my time. Well, it was quite clearly. The Republicans have spent the last 40 years moving things, very, very slowly and methodically moving things. We have to take a long approach. We have to take a long view. And that starts with conversations. That starts with sharing. That starts with understanding these points underneath education, energy. But it also, under, uh, it also means understanding the points of the other side, because if this were a GOP right now, it would say guns and babies and whatever else they're going to throw on there. 
right? Regulations that they don't pay any attention to. We have to be willing to sit down for as long as it takes, including with those people that we have left behind, or perhaps they have left us, and have these conversations. Because here's my goal. Here's what I believe we can do. I mean, no offense to my fellow candidates. I'm a Bucks fan. I'm reading Tom Nelson's book. Dr. Bettino's website is fabulous, by the way, if you go there. Any of them can win or lose by 1%. And we'll be in the same scenario that we are in right now, with the GOP trying to take away people's votes, with them trying to abscond with the election. I want to win by 11%. But that's going to require more than just you, more than just us. That is going to require us to start to have these conversations. So what we're going to provide for you is that conversation. Our website is going to be a learning center. It is going to be available to you. Thanks, sorry. And it is going to be available for you to share, because I think that's how we're going to win this next election. And we're going to get rid of Ron Johnson, because we've got to drop Ron Johnson in here, <laughs> and take care of it. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Peter Pekarski. I'm running to be a United States Senator representing everyone in Wisconsin. When I win, I work for you, not the other way around. So I'd like to know what you think. On a yes or no basis, loud enough for me to hear, does everyone here want to protect our democracy? Yeah. Does everyone here think Donald Trump threatens our democracy? Yeah. And does everyone here, here think that Ron Johnson enables Donald Trump's attacks on our democracy and on our health. Thank you all very much. I got the message. I have asked direct questions of public officials for a long time, so if I'm going to be a public official, it's time for me to answer a few myself, such as, who are you? I'm a fourth generation Wisconsinite. Six generations of my family have thrived in Wisconsin. I was born, raised, and graduated from high school in Milwaukee. I have degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Electrical Engineering and Political Science. My law degree is from Case Western Reserve. My family has defended our democracy for over a century, beginning with my uncle's service in World War I. My father and four uncles served in World War II. I served as a civilian consultant to the Chief of Naval Operations on Strategic Nuclear Weapons Forces and Platforms, and on intelligence analysis to the Director of Naval Intelligence. A national issue when I graduated from MIT was whether we should buy an anti-ballistic missile system. Senator Ted Kennedy opposed the ABM system and placed my senior thesis in the congressional record to support his position. For about the last 20 years, I have been an active participant in the efforts of the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, and other state Democratic parties to protect our elections and every voter's right to cast a ballot. For the 2020 election cycle, at the request of the Biden campaign during the primaries, the California Democratic Party, the DPW, and other groups, I donated about 2,000 hours of my professional time to various election protection activities. In 2020, I also contributed to the campaign of every Wisconsin Democrat running for a seat not then held by a Democrat in the Wisconsin legislature or the U.S. House of Representatives. As an attorney, I have been a lead trial counsel in cases including a contest of a presidential election. My career has involved the interaction of law with many scientific and technical fields directly relevant to the issues faced by a United States Senator and to our elections. Next question, why are you running for a Senate seat? I'm running for a Senate seat because of an author and a lawyer I ran into a while ago. Uh, the author wrote, gave speeches, uh, asked a lot of questions. The answer to one of the questions that author asked for me today is, continue my family's long tradition of honorable, honorable public service by being a United States Senator from Wisconsin. The question was, what can you do for your country? That author was Jack Kennedy, who was a U.S. Senator when I met him. 
And the lawyer with him was Bobby Kennedy. Next question, what are you planning to do if you win? What I plan to do if I win is to deal with the needs of our state and our nation. Many of the big issues, such as providing quality health care as a basic right, protecting the rights of workers and their unions, protecting our environment and prioritizing our fight against climate change, reducing economic inequality, stopping systemic racism, justice for veterans, and ending forever wars are discussed on my campaign website. I promise you'll have the URL before I finish. Because science is essential to dealing with many issues facing us, such as providing quality health care as a right for all Americans, let's talk about science. Given that we are just a few miles from the main campus of the University of Wisconsin, let's consider what science developed at UW has done, is doing, and will do to provide quality health care for many Americans. The scientists at UW took rat poison and turned it into a drug that has saved millions of people's lives and made their lives better. The rat poison in, in an appropriate dosage is now known as warfarin, W-A-R-F-A-R-I-N. The W-A-R-F stands for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which commercializes research done at the University of Wisconsin. Doctors prescri prescribe warfarin when indicated, and people take warfarin because it is a blood thinner which helps prevent clots which cause strokes. As is the case with warfarin, education and science benefit many people in addition to those who receive the education. The issue which will be considered in Congress, if I have anything to say about it, is how do we invest in our nation's future by educating the next generation of Americans in science and many other fields while we address the cost of current education and the debt now severely burdening many graduates in a manner which helps students and graduates, provides well-educated future leaders, and is equitable for those who did not obtain a post-high school education. While thinking about spending money, in particular for education or for almost endless undeclared wars, think about this. First, every time we decide to spend a billion dollars, we have a choice. We can pay for whatever is being proposed or we can pay full tuition for a year for 100,000 students at the University of Wisconsin, or full tuition for a year for 200,000 students at a technical college. Second, the cost of keeping troops in combat overseas is about one million per soldier per year. If you have 1,000 troops in combat overseas for a year, that's a billion dollars. Before we make the decision to send those troops, there is one other question each of you and each member of Congress must ask. What military threat is posed to the United States of America by the country where the troops will be fighting. That's before we send them. I'll leave that as a thought exercise for each of you. Another thing I plan to do if elected is to deal with the effort of the majority of Republicans to interfere with the security and freedom of our elections. The security of the system is now under consideration by Congress and will probably be of concern for a long time. Our election system is hardware and software dependent, complicated and technical. In order to legislate properly about our election system, a U.S. Senator needs an understanding of various aspects of computer hardware and software, cryptography, electrical circuits and signals, internet communications, internet devices, microprocessors, semiconductor design, semiconductor processing, statistics and telecommunications because of the impact those fields have on the security and operation of the current system. We're a long way from hand-counted paper ballots. I have the necessary understanding, which appears to be shared at most, that is the necessary understanding of these fields, which I have used over the last 20 years to protect our elections. That understanding appears to be shared at most by only one other person seeking the nomination. It is, it is essential for a U.S. Senator to be able to understand the use and limits of technology. Technology is central to many issues we face. For example, addressing climate change, by using solar and wind power to produce energy. For a second example, providing high-speed broadband throughout Wisconsin, most particularly including rural Wisconsin. For a third, allowing our farmers to have unrestricted access to the hardware and software on their farm equipment and to repair their own equipment rather, for, rather than forcing them to wait for days and then pay a lot of money if equi equipment needs repair immediately, for example, when crops are being harvested. 
Given my education, training, and experience, I understand technology and its limits. I ask for your views, your support, and your votes. I ask for your views when we talk this afternoon or when you want to send them to me to my campaign website at pekarskiforwisconsin.com. That's the URL I promised. And the four in there is F-O-R, it's not the number. I ask for your support, financially if you are able to do so. And more importantly, to organize this state starting now with the goal that every Wisconsin Democrat who runs next year wins. Please volunteer on the Join Us tab on the campaign website, pekarskiforwisconsin.com. I ask for your vote in the primary. I also offer all of you an opportunity to engage in an experiment with technology right now. My remarks may have been a bit convoluted. I'd like to put them in your hands so you can review them at your convenience. With your help, I'd like to do so in an environmentally conscious manner rather than on paper. I've had a solid signal with the internet putting my speech text on this phone since I started speaking. The experiment is to determine what happens if all of you hit the site at the same time. Please take your smartphone and review the text of my remarks, which is available right now at pekarskiforwisconsin.com forward slash Sunday. That's pekarskiforwisconsin.com forward slash Sunday. If there are technical issues, please, please let us know and we will address them. Thank you very much for your attention, your participation in the experiment, your views, your support, and your votes to protect our democracy. Thank you again. So what I'm seeing right here is, in my opinion, democracy at its best. This is the kind of politics I believe in. We're normal people, we get together, we talk about the future of our state, we talk about elections, and we talk about how we're gonna organize and win in 2022. Are we ready to do that, Wanaki? Yeah. Now, I got my start in politics just across uh, the lake here uh, at UW-Madison. Do we have any Badgers in the house? All right. Now, during my time at UW, I started organizing uh, young candidates to run for a local office. I started to find and really trust uh, my voice. And it was also during that time that I told my parents that I was probably not going to be an engineer with my life. And uh, that took them a little bit of time to process. Now, they are from India, they're immigrants from India, and the idea of getting involved in politics was a very foreign concept for them. The idea of running for office was even crazier. You know, what they said is, you should find a job after graduating. That was their number one concern. And uh, throughout college, I didn't have a good answer for them either. What kind of job can you get in politics? That was what my dad would always remind me of. Uh, but I had a life-changing experience uh, during my time on campus, which is uh, Barack Obama uh, came to campus. Uh, and uh, his team asked me to be an opening speaker at the event. And so I, I stand in front of about 26,000 people. And from that point onwards, I've been on a mission uh, to transform our politics. And the mission is very simple. Right now, the current levels of hate and dehumanization and division in our politics is at an unsustainable level. Uh, this is not a sustainable democracy that we'd be able to pass on uh, to our grandchildren. We have to elevate, in my opinion, a much more inclusive, compassionate, and honest form of politics. And it was with that spirit that uh, about a month and a half ago, we announced our exploratory committee for the US Senate. Now, as a, someone who grew up in Brookfield, Wisconsin, uh, my opinion, which if anyone here knows something about Brookfield, you know, it's traditionally a very conservative area, very red uh, area. You know, it's my opinion that in order for us to win statewide, we have to not only go to places uh, where we know we're going to get a lot of votes, but also go to places like my hometown. And because leaders recently have practiced that style of politics, we now have Democratic state representatives representing my hometown and the surrounding areas. So that's, that's very important. Now, one of the big things I think we lack in a lot of elected officials right now is this profound concept I learned during my days as a musician in Madison. Listening. Listening, I think, is one of the most scarce resources I've found uh, in politics. And that is why, as referenced, uh, we launched our Dignity Tour. Uh, because I strongly believe that the number one skill in a US Senator is listening with a lot of humility. And we've been going across the state. Uh, we recently were in Blanchardville hearing from dairy farmers. We heard from formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs in Milwaukee. And one of the powerful takeaways from these conversations, as different as they were, as divergent the 
personal experiences were, the one common theme is they feel like our politics are not serving them. They feel left out. They feel like their politicians aren't truly hearing them, that we need to elevate a more dignified style of politics. And that is why my mission in this race is to elevate a new kind of politics rooted in dignity and opportunity for all. Now, another important thing for a US senator, uh, I believe, is not just introducing bills. Sometimes you hear this in Congress, messaging bills that were never meant to pass in the first place. I believe the right kind of leadership we need are US senators who are able to pass legislation pass legislation so people here in Wanakee, whether you're a small business owner or you're a farmer, you're getting real relief from the federal government. And that's been my experience over the last decade. As reference, I founded a group called the Millennial Action Project, which is dedicated to building diverse coalitions of young legislators to pass legislation, particularly on issues where there hasn't been a voice. And with that model, working in Congress and in states across the country, we passed clean energy funding. We passed multiple criminal justice reforms. And probably the one I'm most proud of is after the horrific Parkland shooting, when people said you can't do anything about gun violence, it's too divisive, you can't find enough agreement. We hosted those Parkland students on Capitol Hill in our coalition there. Those students were calling on us to change the laws with the moral authority that only they had. And because of those meetings, we built a coalition that said something very simple. The Centers for Disease Control should be able to study gun violence as a public health issue. The CDC had been banned from doing that for two, two decades. And I'm proud to say that because of that coalition, that legislation passed, and today the CDC is authorized to study gun violence as a public health issue and is funded to do that kind of research. So that is real change. And the reason why I share these stories with you, and there's so many other issues I could share as well, the point is to say that change is possible when we see the best in each other, when we build coalitions, and we organize at the grassroots level. That is the kind of politics that not only I believe in, that's the kind of politics I think we need to pass on to our children and grandchildren. You know, I was looking up the set list of the Raging Grannies. They have a song I like a lot. It's called, Do You Hear Wisconsin Sing? Do you hear Wisconsin sing? I believe now is the time for us, our state, to find a new voice. I think the way we're portrayed in the media is not right. We've become this symbol of trench warfare politics, of polarization, of denial of human rights, especially for unarmed black men. We've become a symbol of so much negativity in our politics. And yet, at the same time, we know there's another story, too. You know, one of the experiences I had a few years ago here in Madison was we organized a red and blue dialogue series with people who've been left out of politics to talk about higher education and clean energy and the environment. And one takeaway from that that I think is so important here is there is a much better politics just beneath the surface. If you have friends who come and visit Wisconsin, what do they always say? Wisconsinites are the nicest people I've ever met. So how come our politics don't reflect that? I believe it's because our leaders are not summoning that style of politics. I believe we can elevate it, and that is the voice I think we need to hear in this election. But it requires courage. It requires us to tune our ears to that voice. It requires us to have the conviction to seize it. It requires us to believe it's possible. And if we do that, we will not just win this election in 2022. We will do something even more profound than that. We will renew our democracy for the next generation. We will actually pass legislation that our communities need right now to take on climate change, to take on gun violence, to make sure we have real economic mobility and more dignified forms of work. That is the opportunity we have in this election. And if you have that same passion that I do to stand up 
for when the future generations are calling for it. If you feel the same moral obligation that I do to organize right now, please sign up, join us. Uh, Victoria, raise your hand real fast. Sign up. We're building a movement here in Wisconsin that we'll be telling our grandchildren about. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to give a big thank you to Laureen Bach and Jackie Schultz, two just incredible organizers here in Wanakee that do so much for their community. And I just feel honored to work with them.